GP Dr Glenn Cahoon works with young people in the Hora Whenua. Here he talks about his love of poetry and words and how they shape his medical practice. I don't know where poetry comes from. I think it's like a river with a whole lot of little tributaries. It drifts down. It goes right back to growing up in South Auckland and hearing the way words were used. Growing up in a small church, so there was always sermons and these and thous and memory texts and ministers preaching and hymn singing. That holiness, the holy use of words and the power of King James Version, that sort of holiness and words used to convince juxtaposed about going out into the playground and people going, Oh, shame, manus! And growing up in this melting pot of cultures where language was used to be cheeky, get in trouble, get into fights, get out of fights, impress a girl, impress a boy, um, charm your way in and out of things. It was, for me, it was me being a rock star. They're knotted pieces of word art that are not saying what they're saying. And that if you look at them, if you turn them around, you can find a secret chamber that's saying something elegantly simple. Or they're a thing that brings you to realization of something that you already half knew. And it, it's like they take you by the hand and they wander you through the bush. And then all of a sudden, they open you on this view and you see something, a jisalt. Dr Cahoon talks about his latest poetry collection letters to young people that were inspired by his rangatahi clients. Yeah, well, I never know if it was a poetry project set in a medical context or a medical project using poetry. It was sort of both. Um, but I, it grew out of a young person that I saw who we used to have quite a few conversations about her wanting to die and... I had lots and lots of suicidal thoughts. And she was unhappy and I was really challenging questions about why she should be left to be unhappy and what was life worth living for and why should the world of big people demand of her that she should live. And, and you know, I'm forced to admit that those are good questions for an unhappy young person to ask and, and the engagement of mental health services and all the full weight of our... Western medicine was arraigned against her and she still wanted to know why she should live. And so I wanted to write to her about that because I really had to go away and think, why would I ask a person to live who's unhappy? What would I say to them? And I knew that I wanted to say, it is, I'm right. There is something about living that's spectacular. But I didn't know what to say to them. So I guess for me, I defaulted to writing a poem and giving it to her. And it took me ages to write the poem. I started and stopped it many times. And I did that and gave it to her. And then I thought that it might be nice to write to some other young people. And does that help in the ongoing long-term relationship with them? Does it help move stuff if they've got stuff to work on? Most of them were just really touched. And I think that's probably the biggest thing is they didn't really care about the poem. They're like, what does that even mean? <laughs> it's more like, oh wow, you saw something in me that made you want to write a poem. I was, I'm inspiring. And I can honestly say they were. So I think they liked that. For some of them it definitely changed the focus of the relationship and other things opened up and other ways of saying. And, and there were some remarkable moments of interaction. I wrote most of the poems as poems, as 21st century English poems. And that's not really the way poetry comes to young people now. The way poetry comes to young people now is through rap and hip hop and spoken word. And so it made me feel old. So I've written a, a hip hop album that's just got a producer on board with some collaborators, because I'm a shit rapper. And, you know, modern 21st century word art, or poetry for lack of a better word, is often about not saying a thing, whereas rap is 
just say what you are going to say and say it in a way that gets attention. And it's ruthlessly political. So the kids have corrupted my mind. They've taught me to swear badly. It makes me see the world in a completely different way. I can look at a tympanic membrane and see a crocodile, yeah? That's why. And if I don't write poetry, I won't see that. You know, when I look in your ear and I see the tympanic membrane and through that, the eardrum and like the smallest bones in the body, these used to be like a big old alligator jawbone and they evolved down into tiny, tiny, tiny little bones that help me hear. So even human beings are at the end of this long, 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 long evolutionary story. It's good to know that you used to be a reptile once, that there's an alligator living in your ear. The imagination is a muscle, and if you use it, there comes a point at which, I swear to God, the world starts to pop and fizz, and a moment becomes a ranch slider you can open up and disappear into, and I don't know, I get stoned on it. It's the most remarkable way of looking at the world. It's like it, it fizzes. But it only happens if I keep turning this big subconscious wheel. And that takes diligence and work to keep it turning. Mm -hmm.